Hi, this is Denise LaRosa, and you're listening to Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa, a podcast show created by a mom for moms. I do not take for granted that you have a lot on your plate, yet you are taking the time to listen to my show. I am truly grateful. Be sure to stay connected by visiting www.deniseinlarosa.com, following me on Twitter at Denise and LaRosa, and liking my Facebook page, Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa. It is my hope that Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa will motivate, inspire, and inform you along your journey in motherhood. So let's dive in. As of 2014, the average cost to raise a child in the United States rang in at a whopping $245,000. These stats got a lot of buzz over the summer of 2014 and quite frankly made a lot of people nervous at the thought of having children. While raising children can be expensive, it's important that we don't focus on the price tag but rather focus more on the priceless value these little lives bring to us and our society. Not only that, but raising children in this day and age does not have to totally break your wallet. There are many ways to save while providing for your children. FemFrugality.com is a website created by a mother who believes that happiness is not dependent upon being monetarily wealthy, but poverty sure can rain on your parade. So she has found countless ways to save money yet create a high quality of life for her family, and she shares those strategies on her website. So what are some practical and surprising ways you can save some money in your wallet while providing for your children? You are about to find out. Preparing for a baby can be so super expensive. I mean, I know with our first child, everybody was excited, and so we got a lot of help in, you know, having the baby shower and everything, but it is no joke. I feel like it is big business, but it's kind of hard to decide like what to really spend big bucks on and what not to. So what are your tips for preparing for a baby without spending a fortune? Absolutely. It can be so intimidating because the price tag is just so big. The first thing that I'm going to tell you to do is to max out your health insurance. You're paying for those benefits and a lot of those benefits you might not even know exist, but they can be huge and they can save you a ton of money. Now, some health insurers, they provide rewards programs for new moms. And what those are is if you're going to your prenatal appointment, you're taking your prenatal vitamins, they'll provide you with an item of baby gear. And the three most common that I've seen across programs are strollers, pack and plays, and car seats. So what you want to do is the second you find out you're pregnant, yeah, it's huge. Uh, The second you find out that you're pregnant, you want to call them up, see if they have the program, and get all the necessary paperwork. And then you go to your appointments, you have your doctor sign off this piece of paper, and then uh, towards the end of your pregnancy, the program completes and you send it all in, and you get to pick uh, which thing that you need. And it's just really great. I mean, we're doing all of those. Yeah, it's it really is amazing. And you're doing all those things anyways. You know, we're all going to our prenatal appointments. We're all taking those vitamins. And one of those things can easily save you 50 to $150 or more. So that's a pretty wow. huge benefit that you, not again, not all insurers provide it, but it's definitely worth calling and checking out to see if yours does. The next thing that you want to check and see what their coverage is on um, is breast pumps. Um, Most of them are going to provide rentals for you if you have troubles breastfeeding, like if your child has whatever problem latching on or if your milk production isn't up, they're going to provide you with a rental. Now, most insurers provide that, and then a smaller amount of insurers provide the breast pump for you, period, the end. It doesn't matter if you're not going back to work. It doesn't matter. uh, You don't have to have problems feeding your baby. They'll just give it to you. And that's a savings of easily well over $200. So that's worth checking out. And if they do provide that, you want to check well before the baby is born because you know how insurance is. You know, you go in and you file the paperwork and it takes forever for them to do everything on their end. But it's it's worth the wait and it's worth getting done before baby arrives. And with the rentals too, even if that's all they provide, really familiarizing yourself with their policies before baby gets there just so that if, you know, heaven forbid, you need to use that, you're familiar with it and you can kind of just hit the ground running. That way you don't have to pay for it in the meantime or go through that process whenever you're you're recovering postpartum. So the last thing I'm going to say with insurance is hypoallergenic formula. You always hope that you're not going to need something like that. But if your baby does need it, it's a prescription formula. And if you think that regular formula is expensive, this stuff is jaw on the ground expensive. 14 states require that insurers cover it. Now, unfortunately, Pennsylvania is not one of them, but it's still worth it to call and check because if they do provide 
provide this benefit and you do end up needing it, it's going to be huge in saving your budget and your financial future because that stuff is no joke. It's usually a reimbursement process. So you're going to want to save all your receipts. You're probably going to have to jump through a lot of hoops to get it, but it's well worth it in the end. That is incredible. You are just... I. I don't know. It's like I almost want to have another baby just so I can go through this whole process and, like, save some money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I actually I have a couple other things that are, like, not insurance, too. Because, I mean, those things are great, but there's a lot of other stuff that you've got to do day to day, too. One major thing that's been huge for us is accepting hand-me-downs and not just accepting them but getting the word out not being like oh okay sure I'll take your stuff but actually telling friends and family hey we're having a baby soon and we don't mind getting stuff second hand if you know anyone that has a kid and they're donating their stuff or their kids have outgrown things we will take it and that's been really huge for us for our eldest we have a lot of friends and family that have kids of the same gender and we haven't had to buy hardly any clothes for them and, you know, when they're so little, they outgrow stuff so quickly. So a lot of the stuff you're getting has been worn once or twice or maybe even not at all. So it's yes. that's pretty amazing. I am definitely on board with that because we accept hand-me-downs, and I wore hand-me-downs, and I'm totally with you. I mean, we've had to spend very little money on clothes for the girls. And so that's something that's huge because, like you said, they're not – going to be in these clothes that long just wash them if you're really that paranoid about it I mean it's really no big deal and people don't they don't know that they're hand-me-downs and so what if they did you know I think sometimes we have to just let go of the pride like you know just be sensible because I think a sensible thing to do is definitely hand-me-downs when you're talking about children because like you said they go through these clothes so quickly Absolutely. And they're not going to care until they're in middle school or something. You know, they're not going to know. Their yeah. friends aren't going to know. You know, you can worry about that when the preteen years come. So. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, we've gotten a lot of the clothes, but it's not just for that. You can get toys, high chairs, like pretty much anything that you need. And then our baby that's another gender, for them, we haven't had friends and family that have all those hand-me-downs to give us. So what we've done is we've used resale stores, and they're awesome. You know, people come in, and they, they're going to get rid of old stuff, so they come in and get like a nominal amount of money to trade it in and then the store resells it and the prices are super low like we've gotten brand name clothing items there for a dollar or two sometimes and that's just I mean that's been really amazing too so those two things for sure there are a couple of things that you really do need new though like a car seat and a breast pump those are things that you really don't want to get used for those yeah. it's using coupon sales reward points you know the basic stuff and it might take you a little bit of time to match everything up but if it's saving you a significant amount of money it's well worth it yes i couldn't agree with you more that brings me to another question so what about this buy name brand thing? Because there are times where buying a name brand product will be worth it for your baby. So when is that a time that when is there a time that you suggest people use name brand products for your baby? Well, um I think a lot of that's gonna depend on your personal experience and preferences. So these things will probably just be my opinions and what I've had good luck with. But for everyone, it's going to be a little different, I think. Our big thing was getting a baby Bjorn. With my first one, we had a baby carrier, and I don't even know what brand it was, but I would carry around my baby. There was no neck support, so I'm, like, holding them, supporting their neck anyways. It was really uncomfortable. It fit really weird, so my back was always hurting. But I just thought, you know, you're carrying another human being. It's not going to be comfortable. I didn't see anything wrong with it. And then when my second was born... We actually got a baby Bjorn as a hand-me-down, and it was amazing. There was neck support. I didn't have to always be holding them close to my chest with my hand. My back, my neck, my shoulders felt better. So that was really amazing. And if I was out shopping for baby gear, I would definitely splurge on that. Another one that's really a big deal for me, this isn't necessarily brand name, but it's something that I spend a little bit more money on, is stuffed animals. I will only Aww. buy them in sealed boxes. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, you think about you think about the life cycle of that stuffed animal. You know, it goes to the store, and then you think about what happens to it before you bring it home. Maybe there's a little kid, and they wipe their nose. They don't wipe it off on their pants or use antibacterial hand hand sanitizer or anything. They just 
you know, run to the toy, grab it, and say, Mommy, Mommy, can I have this? And it ends up back on the shelf because you buy it later, so you know Mom says no. So they put it back, um, but those germs don't go back. And it's really gross. You think about all the things little kids do before they play with toys at the toy store, and then you bring it home. You can't put it in the washer because you can't put it in the dryer. You don't want to use anything too strong on it because baby might be putting it in their mouth. But those germs are still there. So that's one thing I'm a little bit (laughs) paranoid about and one thing that I will spend a little bit more money on is the stuffed animals, just making sure they're in a box and sealed away from little kid germs. The last thing would probably be just getting a decent stroller. It doesn't have to be the deluxe brand, but if you go out and get those $20 umbrella strollers, there's not a lot of support for babies, babies skin back and everything when they're really little. And also they just wear out really quickly. We go on a lot of walks living in the city, going to the park, going pretty much everywhere. And those $20 umbrella strollers just wear out really quickly. They're not easy to maneuver. And by the time your child doesn't need a stroller anymore, you've probably spent just as much, if not more, just replacing that one over and over again. So a good stroller was a really good investment for us, too. That's great. Yes. You know, I started off trying different brand diapers and off-brand, name-brand. And what I found was a particular name-brand diaper worked best for my child just because she didn't have an allergic reaction to it or a rash, but that's just like because of her skin care needs. So I guess I guess that could also be a, a time when you may call for having a name brand product is, you know, for reasons like allergies or sensitivity, uh, skin sensitivity and stuff like that. Yeah, one of ours actually we use gloves with. And it was the only brand that wouldn't give them a rash. And then we tried with our other one. We had the same problem. And the only thing that really worked for them was Huggies. So a lot of that, again, is going to depend on your own experiences, your own kids, their sensitivities, and all of their different needs. But that's a really good point. (laughs) I love, I'm on this new journey of crafting, which I was a teacher before working from home and doing the mompreneur thing. So I was so terrible with crafts. Like my coworkers always made fun of me and I taught kindergarten. So what was I thinking? So (laughs) my poor students, they wouldn't even know. Like I remember I drew a cow on the board and the kids were like, what is that? I I don't know what that is. (laughs) So anyway, I am, I'm on this like crafting craze. I mean, my daughter, my oldest daughter and I were always, making these crafts and we this year we did total like craft gifts for Christmas and it was a huge money saver and it was from the heart and we just loved the whole process of doing it so it made me think of you and I wanted to ask you what are like your top DIY items for parents that they can do themselves and probably have fun in the process definitely um I actually I used to work in a preschool and I'm not very crafty either, to be honest. But my co- but we would always be doing fun art projects, and my coworkers would be like, "Well, you're really good at this." I'm like, "No, you don't understand. I'm really not. I'm really good at googling things." And this was like in the pre Pinterest days. So, <laughs> but yeah, so I totally hear you on that. And I think a major thing with DIY is to play to your talents and what you enjoy doing. Because if it's going to be a nightmare, there is no need to give yourself that extra stress. Parenting is stressful enough. But um, it, like an example. Example of that for me is whenever my first was born, the huge thing that people were doing was puree their own baby food to save money over those jars at the store. And I tried it, and it was so not fun. I was staying up <laughs> really late at night to get a week's worth of baby food done, or I was trying to do it when my kid was around, and they were mobile, and they started getting into trouble, and I'm up to my elbows and mushed up peas. And <laughs> it was just adding so much stress to my life. I was like, I don't care how much money this is saving me. I'm not doing it anymore. But um, that being said, some of playing to some of my strengths and what I enjoy doing, I have slightly better than remedial sewing skills. So I've made Christmas stockings for our family that saved some money. As my kids get older, I'm able to mend some of their clothes, uh, especially as they get through the toddler stage and everything starts lasting not quite as long. And then with the clothes that they beat up too bad to even donate or fix, I'll make blankets out of those, like toddler bed blankets. So that's pretty fun. Another really fun project that we did, um, my husband and I, we refurbished a dresser. I got some free paint from a promotion that the paint company was having, and I had a neighbor give me some sandpaper. My sibling's friend loaned me 
some paint brushes. I think the only thing we ended up paying for was the primer. And uh, my not so baby anymore, but my baby still has that in their room and we still use that. So that was really fun. I was pretty proud of ourselves for pulling it off. And the major, major thing that we do in our house is cleaning products. A lot of it's just baking soda and vinegar and it works amazing. Some of it works better than all those chemicals that we use every day. And they also cost a whole lot less than those chemicals. I'm making products that cost me pennies on the dollar. But again, I think that the biggest thing is to just not give in to Pinterest pressure. You can be a good mom and not DIY things. If you find things that you like to do and they're going to save you money, that is awesome and that is good and you should definitely do it. But if it is adding so much stress to your life that you're up to your elbows and mush fees and you just want to die, then just stop because that extra stress that you're adding on yourself is going to end up giving you worse health problems down the line. And if you add up that stress over enough time, your medical bills for it are going to not even be worth the DIY savings. So just find something that you enjoy doing, and hopefully it saves you a little bit of money along the way. Oh, that's great advice. That is really, really, really great advice because we are living in a Pinterest world, and not knocking Pinterest, but you see all of these things on there, and you just feel like, as a mom, I've got to make this. I've got to make that. And part of it's because you see it and you think it's really cool and it would be a lot of fun. But I think it can, there's this line that you end up crossing sometimes and it can be a lot of stress and a lot of pressure. And then you find yourself trying to do these things that maybe you don't really want to do or you don't really have the talent for doing. So I love your advice. Exactly. Yeah, like don't even go there. You know, don't stress yourself out. It's not that serious, people. Exactly, exactly. And I think there, I think that, I mean, we've done a lot of cute stuff off of there. But I also, I've also fallen victim to the pressure before. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm not DIYing everything for my kid. I haven't made them a sock snake stuffed animal, so I must be a horrible mother. And that's just, I mean, stuff like that couldn't be further from the truth. Your kids are going to know that you love them regardless of if you make everything for them or buy everything for them. They're going to know that you love them. Yes, yes, absolutely. So now shifting gears, we've been talking about babies, but let's talk about older children and allowances. This is something that I know it can be a touchy subject. Should children have an allowance? If so, what's the process of earning? When should you start? I mean, let's just cover this whole allowance thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, The biggest thing about personal finance is the word personal. A lot of these are going to be personal decisions, and that doesn't mean that one of them is right or wrong. If there is an allowance, I'm a strong component of it being earned and not given. You don't get five bucks a week just because you're alive. This most common way that people enforce that is kids will earn it through their chores. So I would say to start giving it to them when they're old enough to start doing chores, maybe independently, maybe not. If they're helping mom and dad and really helping get the job done, maybe you can start um, before they, they really start doing that independently. I would say by five or six, though, they're, they're capable of doing stuff that they can earn that allowance for. And starting to teach them about money young is really, really great. When you're teaching your kids about money, you want to teach them about things like saving for goals, buying good quality. Uh, For example, maybe they want to get a $1 fire truck. And you could show them, well, you know, you could get the $1 fire truck, or you could save up and get the $20 fire truck a little bit later. It's going to last longer. It does so many more cool things, things like that, you know, just age-appropriate lessons. Also, charitable giving, finding causes or finding things that they're really into. I think when we teach our kids to care, not just with their hearts, but also with their pocketbook really young, it really reinforces that lifelong. Now, after we've taught our kids about money, don't dictate where that money goes. It can be really hard to watch your kids make decisions and watch them make decisions that aren't so great, watch them make mistakes. And as mothers, I think we really want to step in a lot and just save them from that pain. But when we do that, we're denying them a real opportunity to learn a lesson. And those are lessons that we want them to learn in the incubation of our own homes. Because if they get to a point where they're going out into the real world and they're facing some really major financial decisions, should I take out student loans? Should I rack up credit card debt? 
should I, how do I even save? A lot of people, there's like 70 some percent of our country that lives paycheck to paycheck. There are a lot of adults who don't know how to save money. But if we teach these things early in our homes and we let them fail, and we let them learn those hard lessons inside of our houses under our care, then when they go out into the real world, they're going to be really well financially prepared and really able to handle what life throws at them because it's a hard world out there. Now, when you have no allowance, I completely understand that point of view too. The idea behind that is you are a member of this family. There are things that we need to do to make this family function. And when you grow up, you're not going to get paid five bucks a week to wash dishes. Why would I pay you here? And I understand that too. I know that you can still teach those same money lessons and allow those same mistakes and allow for that entire learning process, even if there's no allowance, because your child is still going to have money from birthdays. Maybe grandma sends a little card, congrats for graduating fifth grade, and they have a little bit of money in there. And then when they get older, they'll have a job as well. So just really teaching those sound financial principles and being there to support them and talk to them about what did and didn't work, but not coming in and saving the day. Oh, I love what you're saying. It goes beyond the allowance. I think we hear about to give an allowance or not to give an allowance. And then if you do, you give the money and you don't really hear much else about it. So I love what you're saying that this is a really, really, really amazing learning opportunity for your children to learn about finances and to learn early. And let me tell you, that cannot be a bad thing. It can only be a good thing. The earlier you start learning about that, the better I think. So that's great, great, great stuff right there. So I have one final question for you. And before I ask the this question, I have to say thank you because this is a topic that I think is really important and that I hope my listeners are really going to find a lot of value in. I'm sure they will. This is really good that we're talking about this and so many topics that I think maybe we are thinking about and we don't really know who to ask or how to ask or we're afraid to ask. So thank you so much. Oh, absolutely. All right. So what are your tips on how families can manage their finances when having children? in particular young ones, because we hear about, I know I even did a blog post over the summer, there's this big, big, big talk about the cost of raising a child is $245,000 and all of that, and you hear that price tag, and to me, children don't come with a price tag. I get kind of irritated, to say the least, when I hear about that, because it's like you're putting a price tag on your child, but the reality is, you know, it is a huge financial shift for families, especially when you have multiple children. So uh, what kind of tips do you have for families in managing their money once the children come along? Absolutely, Denise. And I think those numbers get thrown around and we forget sometimes, you know, we're reading these articles and they don't tell us a lot of that is the cost of college. And those sticker price things are huge and are something that we should be worried about. But when we have little kids, we can do a lot of small things like we were talking with hand-me-downs, resale stores, coupons, just to really maintain our budget and keep things kind of even keeled. And we don't have to be tempted into spending a lot of money on our kids. It can really add up fast, but if you make smart decisions, you can really bring that number down by quite a lot. The first thing I want to talk about with managing finances is a little bit morbid, and it's not something that people want to think about or talk about, but it's probably one of the most important things. Um, We don't like to face our own mortality, but having a will is really important. And in that will, doing doing the standard things, establishing medical boundaries for yourself, establishing your estate and who will get what. But a major thing when you have kids is establishing custody of your children and also who will be controlling their money until your children reach an age when they can manage it themselves. Um, If you don't establish that, you just, you don't know what's going to happen when you're gone. Maybe the person you just assumed would take the kids can't or doesn't it doesn't want to, not because they don't love your children, but because of where they are in their life. Maybe the money gets left to Uncle Ray who goes out and spends it all at the casino. You just don't know what's going to happen. So establishing that in a will is really important. Another really important thing is life insurance. And paying for that every month is an added expense to your budget, but it is very, very huge. 
knowing that your kids are going to be taken care of after you're gone, heaven forbid something happen. But while you're here, and we're all going to be here until our kids grow up and get old and everything, <laughs> hopefully. But those are just those are just in case that doesn't happen because sadly, sadly that does happen sometimes. But having health insurance for yourself is another big thing. And there's a lot of changes with this, with the Affordable Care Act and everything. More people are getting insurance. At the same time, people are disappointed with how their plans are changing or aren't changing or how their premiums are changing. Just get familiar with what you've got. Make sure that you have it because the number one cause of debilitating debt in this country is unexpected medical expenses. And by protecting yourself from those medical expenses, you're really protecting your financial future now and for the future for your kids. Um, another big thing is to get your kids health insurance. There's really no excuses on that one. Adults, I get it. Sometimes it's too expensive. We're still trying to navigate our way through all this new policy. But with kids, especially in Pennsylvania, no matter your income, they can get covered. We have the child's health insurance program. Um, Medicaid limits are a lot higher than people think that they are to get your child um, to get your child the health care they need. And if you need those assistance programs, just having the humility to go and do it because it's for your kid's health, because your kid deserves to go to the doctor, not just when they're sick, but for well visits. And then if they, you know, heaven forbid they break their arm or something or they get a cold, you're not going to be going broke because of it. So you, if your kid's not insured, get them insured because there are affordable ways to do it. And then on to the fun stuff, <laughs> Denise, <laughs> let's talk about mm-hmm. budgets. With budget, I really think that we need to meet at least monthly with our partner to make sure we're on the same page and make sure we're doing what we need to be doing. And a lot of people hear budget and they freak out and they think it's so boring. I don't want to do that. I don't want to confront my numbers because my numbers are so real that I just can't even deal with them. But I actually think budgeting can be a lot of fun. If you have any goals, any goals at all. You want to retire. You want to go on a vacation. You want to buy your kid a really awesome toy. You want to buy a new video game. You, anything, anything at all. When you are, right now our big one is saving for a house. That's the one that we're working on. And when you're working on that budget and you're meeting monthly you can, and you're actually doing all those things that you need to be doing, you can see yourself getting closer to those goals. And it's a really, really exciting process whenever you see yourself accomplishing major life events and minor life events that you really want to be enjoying. With your budget, you want to be real. Don't say you're going to spend 20 bucks on diapers this month because we all know that's not going to happen. When I budget, I tend to do it, I budget liberally, and then I spend conservatively. And what that means is if I think I'm going to need 75 bucks for gas this month, I'll budget for 100 And then when I only spend 60 it's not that big of a deal because I have money left over, and I can throw that in savings or do whatever I need to do with it. But if I budget 50 and I end up using 75 now I'm at the end of the month and I've got a crisis going on. I either can't buy gas or I can't pay a bill or I can't pay, you know, I can't save as much money as I wanted to. So that's going to be a major problem. So you, you budget for more than you think you'll need and then you hustle and do everything you can to spend as little money as you can so that you have your tills overflowing at the end of the month instead of being in a scary situation where you can't afford groceries or something. Um, if you find yourself, you're sitting down with your budget and it just doesn't balance, that's when you're going to get creative doing those things that we talked about before, looking at hand-me-downs, couponing, resale stores, and really evaluating your needs, looking at your quote-unquote needs and saying, okay, is this really something that we actually need to survive? Or is this something that we've just had for so long that we can't imagine going without it and actually it's a luxury or a want? And when you sit down and do that and really get real with yourself and your partner, I think you're going to find that there's a lot of things that as Americans we have in our budget that we can afford to cut. You're shopping on sales, you're using coupons, you're doing everything and you still can't make ends meet. You're going to have to buckle down and get out there and earn some more money, (laughs) whether that's asking for a raise at work maybe getting a second job, even if it's just something temporary, like doing mystery shopping or making up those couple bucks at the end of the month. If you hustle now and you go in with your eyes wide open and you do what you've got to do to make it work for your family, it's so much better than getting to the end of the month and realizing, oh, no, I don't know how we're going to eat. Right, exactly. And for the upcoming tax season (laughs) 
And I know people think that taxes, yeah, taxes are super boring and not so fun. But I have a couple things to make it better for you, especially if you have young kids. So um, the first thing that you want to look at is the child independent care tax credit. Last year, so if you're paying for child care, you can claim this tax credit. And last year, I think for one kid, it was around $1,000 if you maxed out. And for two or more kids, it was $2,100. And what that is, is you can deduct your child care expenses. So you figure out your income, you figure out how much you're going to owe in taxes, and then let's say you owe $400 in taxes at the end of the year. If you have that $1,000 credit, you can minimize it down to zero. Now, with that one, you're not going to get any money back, but you can make your tax liability zero, which is pretty awesome. And then the other one that's similar is the child tax credit. Now, we're really lucky, and we don't have to pay for child care. Um, We've been super, super blessed in that respect. But the child tax credit is just for anyone that has a qualifying child or qualifying dependent that they take care of. And you get $1,000 per child reducing that tax. And the awesome thing about this one is that there's actually something called the additional child tax credit. So let's say you owe that $400. You've got two kids and your deduction is $2,000. So 400 of that goes towards making your tax liability zero. You owe nothing. And then that extra $1,600 that you have left over, you claim that as an additional child tax credit, and that's actually going to give you a refund and give you $1,600 back from the government because you have kids. So tax time can be really good and really exciting. Go through everything, even though it seems dry and boring. When that money hits your bank account, you'll be super excited. (laughs) Thank you for tuning in. Be sure to stay in touch with me by visiting www.deniseinlarosa.com, where you can sign up for my newsletter, get some valuable mommy resources, and giveaways. You have been listening to Mom Talk with Denise LaRosa. I will leave you with this quote by Rosaline Dixon. Whatever they grow up to be, They are still our children, and the one most important of all things we can give to them is unconditional love. Not a love that depends on anything at all except that they are our children. Thank you for listening. Hi, it's Denise LaRosa. Thank you so much for visiting me on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed the video and I encourage you to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also check out some more videos. Stay a while and spread the word. I really hope that you spread the word to other mothers because I truly want to help all moms along their journey in motherhood. So let's do this mommy thing together and thanks again for visiting.